break the ego spells that bind. So the ego is a belief, and it is a belief that you might say it's a death wish, but but being a death wish, it's a denial of true love, and so for it to maintain itself, it needs the power of the mind to believe in it. So that's why Jesus says, you made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. Now how do you withdraw your belief from the ego? How do you take your mind's energy and pull it back away from the ego and, and devote it to Spirit, to Holy Spirit? It's really through exposure. If you have unconscious beliefs that you're feeding with, with your mind energy, and you aren't even aware of them, then it's, talk about a parasite. It's in there just sucking the mind of all of its divine energy, and it's using all that mind energy to project out this cosmos. You know, it seems like a pretty vast cosmos. The scientists are still discovering new galaxies, new planets. It just it seems like the stars just go on and on and on and on. As soon as we get a picture of how big it is, it's bigger. And it's bigger and it's bigger and bigger. You know, it's... Talk about a big bang. <laughs> it seems to be a big bang, but it's a big bang that's it's meant to cover over a tiny puff. The Big Bang over the tiny puff. And the more you go deeper with the Holy Spirit's help into the mind, what you will find is that there's, a, there's not multiple egos. There's not six and a half billion egos. Each person doesn't have an ego of their own. It's just one ego. It's kind of like some of you might have seen Star Wars, the movie with Luke, and Darth Vader and everything. Remember the, the, the movie when he's got to go to the Death Star? For Darth Vader and the Empire. It, and he's got to go inside this massive Death Star, which is a giant mechanical, you know, defense system. And he's got to go in with, with the help of Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, with his little spaceship, all the way to the center of the Death Star to make a hit directly on the power plant that runs the whole thing. Isn't that a beautiful metaphor of going in your mind and getting to the root of the ego? It's this huge Death Star, and he's got to go in, and as he goes closer and closer, and he's sure he can't do it. Like, he's sure, it's like, no way am I going to knock, that, knock out the power plant of the Death Star with my little teeny spacecraft. Then basically, Obi-Wan Kenobi used the Force. You see how it's the Holy Spirit uses the Force. You're only going to do it intuitively. You're not going to do it with your five senses. So get your fingers off those instrument panels and get your analysis mind out of there because you ain't, you're ain't. you not taking out the power plant of the Death Star without the Force. That's in that kind of uh, metaphor, that's the Holy Spirit. You know, use the Force. So, so in one sense, you know, when we focus on no private thoughts and no people pleasing, we're putting such an emphasis on exposure. You know, hide nothing, hold nothing back. Because when we hold something back, when we hide it, deny it, protect it or whatever, we're really doing it from ourselves. It's like playing hide and seek with yourself. And it's like trying to trick yourself into maintaining the lie. And, and this path is just saying, just expose it. You know, no matter what it is, just expose it. And, and that's what forgiveness does. I mean, I've, I've enjoyed it actually when I've been able to just have one-on-ones with people where they, they just unload and unburden their mind with their deepest, darkest, most crazy, bizarre, insane secrets that they've kept as secrets because they don't want to tell anybody. Because they're sure, if they tell somebody some of these bizarre things that they've done, that they'll be unlovable. No that there's for sure rejection, for sure abandonment. You know, if, if I tell you my deepest, darkest secret, then you will never love me. And here we go again, the Holy Spirit turns the table and says, oh no, no, no. 
Let, tell me, bring me your deepest, darkest secrets that you think you've done wrong. The ones that you're for sure are sins. The ones that you're for sure that you shall surely be punished for. And the Holy Spirit's like, bring them to me and I will shine them away. I will show you that, that they have no consequence whatsoever. Because, again, you're not a body. Whatever bodies seem to do wrong or right, you know, that's where the sin gets reinforced. It's like, oh, I know I did this, I know I did that. But remember, the Holy Spirit is dismantling all of time and space and showing us that literally, literally, we have never, as a being, as we were created, we have never done anything wrong or right. It's been our misidentification with the body that, that's just reinforced this feeling of, of, of sin, of wrongdoing, of, of somehow that we are wrong, you know, not that we've only done wrong, but we somehow are flawed, and we aren't pure, and the Spirit sees our purity, always. David, do, do we have to dig for that, or, or can we just go, oops, when it comes up? <laughs> you, you don't, in the end, you don't really have to, to dig, per se, in the sense that, I always say, just going through life, I mean, every day, it's going to come up and whack us, whack us in the face, uh, without digging for it, you know, it's going to, it's going to come at us, because remember, the world is just reflecting what we believe, so we're going to get it, it's going to keep coming at us, and coming at us, and coming at us. I remember when I started, when I worked with the Course for a number of years, I would seem to get these bizarre scenarios and situations where people would seem to accuse me of something out of the blue. And I would just think, this is really, like, will this ever stop? Well, this is just insane. The, and then I read that part in the, late in the text where he said, the role of the accuser will appear in many forms and will seem to be accusing you. But have no fear, it will go at last. Ah, just to read that line was like, ah, thank you. Thank you for the hope uh, that that line points to, that promise. And, and in one sense, you don't necessarily have to dig for it. I would say, it's coming to more of a radical self-honesty of whenever you get upset and you're tempted to point the finger or you're tempted to blame, that's where it comes down to this seeing it, this having to really take responsibility for it and realize that, that the offense is not out there in the world, but the, to pluck the offense from the mind, from the consciousness, it's, that's the whole point of the acting out, is just to bring it back and say, what am I offended in? It's not Christ that is offended here. What am I identified with that is offended? And that, that if you consider that digging, then you could say that, but I, I consider that more just paying close attention to whatever the offense seems to be. But there is, there is people that go and shut themselves off in places and and uh, try and do the dark night of the soul. Or, but um, if we just stay present in the mind watching, isn't isn't that enough? Isn't that what you're saying? And that's enough. Yeah, I mean, there can be guidance sometimes from the spirit. If you, if you seem to be really enmeshed in something and a change in form, like going off to a hermitage or something like that, if it would be beneficial mm -hmm. at seeing something or exposing something, it can have value. Like I know when I went off to the woods of Kentucky, um, you know, I was there and oh yeah, right away, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I was probably down there like, three days down living in a little travel trailer in the woods of Kentucky and one of the first thoughts I had, which I just laughed, I said, I am I am addicted to water. I am absolutely addicted to water. It's like the, one of the first realizations, you know, growing up in 
suburban America and just assumed water, 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 and then when I'm down there with no running water, it, that kind of gave me the, the awareness of, of oh, I'm really addicted to water. Uh, and then, and then you, I noticed a lot of other things, like I'm, I'm addicted to the idea of companionship. I'm absolutely, you know, again, you know, Jesus says, you know, you really believe that you are alone unless you are with another body. Yeah, got me, got me on that one too, yeah, I said, yep. You know, you start to, so in one sense, sometimes a guidance to a, to a hermitage or something like that, it, not necessarily as a lifestyle, but just even as a trial period, can be part of the Spirit's guidance. But it still comes back to what you were talking about, the mind watching. It wouldn't do you any good to just <laughs> go live in a cave <laughs> and not watch your mind, you know. You'd just probably be itching and <laughs> damn bug, damn rock, damn tree, you know. I mean, if you weren't watching your mind, you'd probably just be projected onto everything over there and say, I'm going back to my cushy bed, my air conditioning, and my pina coladas, you know, I'm just not, not going to go for that. But, but if you start to realize when you're guided and you're paying attention to your mind, that's a very beautiful thing, regardless of where you seem to be. Uh, oftentimes, like when I traveled around the world, I would just go where I was invited. And, you know, I went through periods where I was yeah, off at the hermitage and living in a travel trader and eating bread and water and trying to starve the ego and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. You try, you try a lot of the stuff. And it doesn't work, and, and then you watch and watch, and then sometimes when I was traveling, one time I would just show up and I would get invited. I was I was in New Jersey one time, and this woman said, "Come to my house and do like a course in miracles gathering." And I said, "Oh, great!" So I went along with her. She like lived in this massive mansion. I mean, I'd never seen anything so big. She had this thing called an atrium. I think the atrium probably had like two or three thousand square feet. It had like a pool and everything, just like the atrium on one side. And then when I said, where do you want me to sleep tonight? She said, oh, you can come and sleep in this wing. And I thought, oh, I never slept in a wing before. And sure enough, it was, it was like she opened this door and there was a wing. And luckily she put me in the first bedroom in the first door, so I didn't have to like go exploring the wing and try to find the bathroom, you know, and, and, but see, that was part of mind training too, you know, you're dealing with a wing, and you got to deal with a wing, you know, you got to find your way around in the wing, and, and it's a different thing when you're down in the, in the woods, and you're just, you know, in a camper, or you've only got so many square feet, you know, then you got to notice your thoughts and your reactions to elbow room, and this and that, or in my hermitage, I had little, I had little drapes, and then I had cockroaches in behind the drapes, and I had little, I used candles, and um, I had this picture of Jesus, uh, with he was kind of sitting over Jerusalem, you could see the lights of Jerusalem behind him, and he just had his, his hands folded on his knee like this. He's kind of very peacefully looking down over the lights of Jerusalem, with his hands kind of laid one on top, and it was very calming little painting I had down there. Actually, that was the last time I'd seen it, and I just went up to Canada, and that's the painting they have at the Peace House. I go, ah, there it is, from my hermitage back in the 1980s, and there it is hanging on Sky's wall up there in Canada. But, but it's just all mind-watching, so in one sense with the spiritual community, it's really, you get a lot of opportunities to do mind-watching when you're in a community. You know, sometimes when you kind of hold yourself off, kind of in solitude, you can still do the mind watching, but it's just when you have a lot of mirrors coming at you from every angle, then the, the temptation to project, or the temptation to feel that somebody's impinging on your private space, or your, your personal zone, or whatever, you know, can, can be more intense. But it's still mind watching. To break the ego spells that bind